Betsy can Thank start. You. Yeah. yeah. So um, welcome everybody to this great implementation debate, a really exciting event that I'm sure we're all really looking forward to. And I'd like to welcome people from all over the country and particularly our participants as well from overseas. And as we're gathering here today, virtually connected from many, many parts of the country and from overseas, I'd like to recognize the traditional lands on which we all do our business today. It's an opportunity to reflect on the meaning of place. And I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Darawal people in the northern Illawarra. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the elders of all the lands on which we work and live. My name is Lucy Wright Chetnik and I'm the co-director of the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre. So I'd just like to welcome you on behalf of the Prevention Centre that's hosting this debate. Um, the Prevention Centre is a collaboration of research and policy that's doing um, research and finding new ways to address the problem of chronic disease. So welcome everyone to this um, exciting implementation debate. Um, we've got speakers who are experts in this field from international renowned speakers in this field who are going to be debating the differences and the challenges of implementation and scale up. And it's an opportunity to advance the concepts and improve our understanding and hopefully will support research collaboration going forward. And the Prevention Centre is um, supporting an implementation and scale up program of work. And we've got a number of speakers from this project. Um, um, this project. And the aim of this project is to improve our understanding of the implementation process and build capacity in the field and develop resources. And there are a number of resources around implementation and scale up already available um, on our website. So I'll hand over now to Mel, who's going to introduce um, the speakers and tell you a bit more about today. So thank you and um, welcome and enjoy the debate. Thank you, Lucy. Hi, I'm Dr. Mel Crane from the University of Sydney and from the Implementation and Scale-Up program, and I'd also like to extend my welcome to you today. Now, I'll just to tell you a little bit of background on what we're doing before I introduce the speakers. So we're going to be uh, running the sessions by having two speakers address one of three questions, and this will be followed by a panel question and answer time. If you have questions you'd like to ask any of the speakers, please use the Slido app and hashtag debate you can go to the link that's on this page and I've also put the link on a number of pages so you can find it. Um, you'll not be able to ask any questions during the sessions, so please indicate if you would like to ask a specific person to address your question. And maybe you don't have questions, but you may be interested in what someone else has, has posted on Slido and you can vote for that question to bring it to our attention. And we'll try to answer as many questions as we can in the question answer time, but we will, we may not be able to answer all. But it, however, if you have a question that is missed, you're welcome to contact us afterwards and just let you know that our sessions will be recorded. Now, I'd like to introduce our first speakers uh, to address the question, is implementation science? So I'd like to invite Professor Luke Wolfenden, who is a Professor of Public Health at the University of Newcastle and Director of the National Centre of Implementation Science, and is also a Program Manager at the Hunter New England Population Health. And following uh, Luke Wolfenden, we will have Professor Adrian Bowen, who is a Professor of Public Health at the University of Sydney and Lead Investigator of the Prevention Centre Implementation and Scale-Up Program and an expert in public health program evaluation. But first to Luke Wolfenden, who will start with uh, answering the question of what implementation science is. Thank you, Mel. Um, I'd just like to start uh, my presentation by also acknowledging the traditional owners to land that we're meeting on today and paying my respects to elders past, uh, present and future. Uh, so if we could just move to the next slide. Um, so implementation science is absolutely a science um, and I'm sure many people would be aware of the definition that is most broadly used to uh, define implementation science uh, proposed by Martin Eccles and that's the study of methods and strategies to promote the uptake and integration of interventions that have proven effective into routine practice or policy with the aim of improving health. Just go on the next slide. 
Right. So what's important there is that it is a science um, and it's not an action associated with delivering an intervention. So it's not implementation per se, um, but the study of it. And so like any science, implementation science uh, uses research questions, involves the collection of data and applies uh, reproducible methods um, to answer scientific questions. It's multidisciplinary, um, but as a science, it's, it's rooted in psychology, uh, organisational and behavioural science, and it's interested in the how and less so um, the what. And so you can probably hear my kids uh, crying on outside the door. Um, and so look, the, the focus of implementation science is how we get existing evidence-based interventions um, into practice rather than the discovery of new interventions or therapies. Uh, implementation science assumes that implementation of an, of an intervention is beneficial and indeed that by improving implementation uh, we will see enhanced um, or we will preserve the benefits of an evidence-based intervention. And there's a good review by uh, Jalak and Dupree uh, which suggests that the application of implementation science uh, to um, interventions can improve their effects by up to 12 times. Um, it uses conventional research methods, both quantitative and qualitative research methods, and um, it applies the research methods that uh, it have grown out of the disciplines uh, that it's based on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, however, it does um, ha have a shift in the focus of inquiry from a conventional public health research. So implementation science covers each of the broad research phases of public health, from problem identification all the way to um, sustaining beneficial effects. Um, but there is a shift in the focus um, whereby implementation science is more focused on the system or staff involved in the delivery of an intervention rather than the recipient of the intervention per se. And so in a conventional health promotion program, uh, we might be interested in, um, in identifying the problem which is defined in, in terms of um, a health benefit or health risk to an individual. And so that may be in this example um, that I provide on the slide here, um, insufficient child fruit and vegetable in intake, which we might diagnose through population uh, surveillance systems. Um, in a conventional health promotion program, we will then assess determinants such as um, you know, food system availability, cost or, or food preferences for children. Um, and then we'll undertake research to identify um, an effective strategy or intervention to address that. Uh, and finally, in the final phase of uh, public health research, we might undertake long-term assessments to see whether improvements in fruit and vegetable intake amongst children are sustained. Um, in implementation science, we're starting from the point where an evidence-based intervention is known, and what we're looking for is evidence practice gaps. So where um, existing evidence-based interventions aren't routinely occurring in practice. And so this may be, for example, um, clinicians not providing um, or not advising smokers to quit, which we know is uh, well established as an effective um, intervention for smoking cessation. Um, again, we'll examine determinants, um, applying similar research methods and then test strategies to improve um, clinician provision of brief intervention like quit advice. And these strategies might include things like training, the provision of guidelines or system prompts. Um, and finally, uh, we, we may be interested in their sustained effects of implementation strategies. And in implementation science, this is largely investigating the ongoing, I guess, sustainment or integration of care provision into routine practice. I guess what's important is that um, across each of these phases, whether it be a, a, a conventional health promotion program or an implementation science research project, the research designs and methods that we use are the same. Uh, next slide, please. So while the research designs are the same, we are, I guess, developing, um, I guess, nuances or um, developing conventions within implementation science in terms of how we might operate or how we might do things at each of these research phases. So we do have methods for identifying evidence practice gaps and prioritising those. And there's a reference there of one example of doing that. Um, in terms of understanding determinants of implementation, uh, implementation science have developed uh, 
I guess, their own frameworks, which are largely um, uh, frameworks which are consolidating uh, behavioural theories um, into, into single multi-level implementation frameworks. The most broadly or widely um, used framework is the CIFA, uh, which I've included um, uh, here by Laura Dam Schroeder. When we undertake trials to test implementation strategies, again, we have kind of our own convention. So we have the STARI guidelines for reporting um, implementation trials. We recently published a paper describing um, implementation trial methods um, that, that, are, that are useful when undertaking implementation projects. And uh, we also have our own measures or measures that we frequently use when we're reporting uh, implementation science research projects in terms of what outcomes um, should be investigated. So I guess I broadly just want to finish by saying implementation science is a science. Um, it is largely based on established methods, um, but we do have um, we have adapted those methods or, or developed our own conventions uh, for this discipline. OK, thank you, Luke. Um, my discussion is really going to be about the differences between implementation science and implementation, which is a great confusion in the field. It's important, it's a chicken and egg thing, which came first, implementation or implementation science, and how can we understand the differences between them? Next slide. In our evaluation textbook, we're trying to describe evaluation methods that are practical for public health programs. Evaluation methodologies are five decades old. Evaluation is really evaluating public health programs that are controlled by the stakeholders, by the policymakers, by the practitioners. And the purpose of evaluation is to inform them. Designs may need to be flexible. You may need to be adaptable. Sometimes implementation really should take several years to happen, but sometimes stakeholders want to implement something in weeks or months. So you have to be adaptable. Um, implementation is focusing on generalizability, how to reach more people. Implementation science is an investigator controlled discipline. It's logical and linear. It's often theory driven and it's building an evidence base for doing implementation better whereas implementation evaluation is evaluating the actual programs. Implementation science needs external funding and is focusing on the quality of the evidence and internal validity. Next slide. This is one of my frameworks for understanding program evaluation. And between the two red bars, the pre and post program measure, we measure impact. But during that process of, of, of carrying out any efficacy or effectiveness program, we're continuously collecting information on program delivery. And that process evaluation is measuring implementation. And we're doing it in a range of ways and we've been doing it for decades. Next slide. Another of our models is the so-called rocket ship model, which is where you move in program delivery from efficacy to replication and dissemination to reach more people. You're focusing less on measuring impact and more on measuring processes or implementation. So the concept of measuring implementation is well established in the program evaluation field. Next slide. But who does what? And this is a really important idea. Who funds? programs at different stages of program delivery. Efficacy is predominantly researcher driven, but as you move to reach more people, policymakers become responsible for delivering the program because it costs tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to deliver a program across a whole system. And finally, to get to what we call program maintenance, which I call institutionalization, which may require a lot just to keep the program going. Next slide. So that when we move from efficacy to dissemination to the right, we're moving from studies that are controlled and generate evidence to interacting with policymakers 
in pragmatic and reactive evaluation. So this is a different set of tasks to the tasks that Luke was describing. In fact, it's often an art form doing program evaluation as well as the science, because what's implemented, how it's implemented, when it's implemented and to whom and on what evidence base are variable. Some policymakers will just implement programs to a lot of people without a lot of evidence, and you've still got to follow behind and try and evaluate those things. So it's both an art and a science, whereas Luke is describing a very necessary evidence generating science. Next slide. So here we have two different scenarios. The researcher shown in the red box is actually pushing research to happen, research on efficacy and effectiveness and the kind of implementation research that is done in detail during effectiveness studies might be realist evaluation. It's in-depth, it may be qualitative, but deeply embedding um, um, an understanding of, of the research and how the program's operating. And then it might be moving to the right, research actions assessing optimal implementation. What's the best strategy for implementation? What works best? What's the most cost effective? And what's the voltage drop? In other words, what's the loss of effect size as you move to deliver a program to more and more people? On the other hand, the pragmatic evaluation is not a push researcher, like push like the researcher, it's a pull strategy from government. It's the feasible evaluation methods you're developing for the population program in which implementation is happening. <clears throat> and that's quite a different set of evaluation tasks. Next slide. So to compare program evaluation to implementation science, there's no standard method in pragmatic evaluation that defines it as pragmatic. It's reactive to when government, NGOs, the private sector want to deliver a program to lots of people. And the aim is to increase reach and assess that. It's flexible and mixed methods, but there's no standard method. There's no starry guidelines that we can use. And we're trying to work out what can be collected in six months, 12 months, whatever time we have. And the implementation science is different to implementation because it's scientific, investigator initiated to understand or test best implementation strategies. And it's not time bound. The research cycle may and should take three to five or more years. And that's an important difference. Next slide. Implementation scientists have even started to develop frameworks and labels for things, but they're actually borrowing quite a lot from program evaluation methods, but putting it into a scientific frame. There's a great popularity in hybrid implementation effectiveness designs, type one of which is just thinking about implementation, type two of which is doing implementation process evaluation during an effectiveness study. We've been doing that for years in program evaluation, but this is codifying it and making it standard. And type three is doing the kind of testing implementation strategies and testing to see in, in controlled studies to see which works best before recommending something to policymakers. So one is recommending to policymakers and implementation is following on what policymakers are already doing. Next slide. So to conclude, and I'm going to use the S word for the first time in my talk, program evaluation at scale, the S word, is often different to the work carried out by implementation science. There are different drivers and funding mechanisms. Scale up is usually on a real world system constrained time scale and values perspective, and you need pragmatic evaluation decisions about each scale up opportunity. Implementation science is doing a, a linear research program of work to give the best advice to policymakers on how to deliver to a large population. And the overlap hybrid, and in the bottom there is overlap, would be termed scale up with a science perspective, and there is some overlap. It's the best methods possible given the uncertainties in delivery at scale in real world problems. 
But although there is overlap, there are also discreetly different parts of scale up and implementation science, which are a little different in their values, methods and perspectives. Scale up's a bit of an art as well as a science and implementation is clearly a scientific approach. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Luke. Now on to our next speakers who will speak about what they think the difference between implementation and scale up is and it may be different to what uh, Adrian has just described to us. So I'd like first like to welcome Professor Heather McKay from the University of British Columbia, an eminent international expert in implementation design and scale up of health promotion programs for schools, communities and settings for older adults. She's done it all. And I would also like to welcome after uh, Heather, Dr. Nicole Rankin, who is the Director of the Implementation Science Program at Sydney Health Partners, and is also a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Sydney. So over to Heather. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Do you yes. have audio? OK, yes. thank you. I am speaking uh, to you from Canada, beautiful Whistler, Whistler, British Columbia. I'm on the unceded traditional territories of the uh, Musqueam, Squamish and Slay with Tooth First Nations people. Um, as settlers here, we are really grateful for the opportunity to live, work and play on these lands. Um, I'll take the next slide, please. First of all, I want to acknowledge that this is a really confusing landscape. As we entered into implementation science, it was really a bit of a bit of voodoo. I mean, there are lots of terms defined similarly, and there are lots of same definitions that have that have um, there's lots of different definitions that have similar terms, and it is quite a confusing landscape within implementation science. So, I want to begin by acknowledging that. Next slide, please. Um, the definitions depend on your sector, if you're working with population and public health, or if you're working in health services, you're going to see the language is, the language is quite different. The same um, in uh, Canada and Australia, we use implementation and scale up more often than in the US where they use dissemination and implementation research. Next slide, please. So my job, I think, is to convince you that scale up is a science. I, uh, our esteemed speakers have already suggested that scale up is a process, and I agree with that. But I hope by the end of my now five minutes, I, I'm going to sort of encourage you over to my side of the fence here. So um, implementation and scale up, the process of both of these, not the science of both of these, are conceptually distinct, but not mutually exclusive. I can implement without scaling up, but I cannot scale up without implementing. Next slide, please. Implementation, the process of putting something into practice is a really simple concept, and it's used as an umbrella term as defined by Robin here, um, of simply put, of integrating evidence-based interventions in, within a setting. Next slide, please. Scale up is also a process, the process of scale up, and this is the world health definition on the top. But you can see as we start to look more closely at the definition of scale up, we're now looking for the effects of something we showed to be to have impact on a small scale within a small implementation study now to have more impact on a broad scale as we go to larger and larger scale and eventually have policies and program security that supports them into the future. So their different scope and scale clearly. Now, my understanding of scalability, and you're going to hear more about this from Andrew in the next pairing, but this is whether an intervention itself can be scale. Is it a flexible, adaptable intervention? If it hasn't designed to be that, it will not be possible to scale it up. You cannot retrofit an intervention to implement it at scale if it was not designed to be um, scaled up. Next slide, please. Um, and scale up, as I said, is a process, and I and I reiterate that here because I want to focus you on the word adapting. So as we move to scale up, what we're now doing is we're changing the delivery system. We're not looking at, for example, in our in our 
um, project called Choose to Move, our activity coaches delivering the intervention to older adults. We're looking at organizations who are using implementation strategies and then um, and, and organizing to, to change their system to deliver the larger program. And they need to adapt in order to do that. So there has to be flexibility, but we want them to stay, re to retain fidelity to the intervention as it was designed. So this adaptation, fidelity, tug of war, is something that lives in a big way within scale up. Next slide, please. Um, Lehman would suggest that scale-up strategies have a classification of their own. And here again, we see this concept of now we're intervening with multiple setting, multiple actors, multiple organizations in broader systems when we go to scale up. Next slide, please. And is it a science? Well, I just asked Miriam Webster or whomever what um, the definition of science was. And it's if you look at be something such as a sport or technique that may be studied or learned, like systemized knowledge, then I believe that we study scale up in a systemized way because we need to understand those uh, those factors that inhibit and those factors that support scale up. So I believe there is a science that allows us to study whether or not we can implement at broad scale. Next slide, please. So implementation science, as you've already heard, is an umbrella term. You've already heard these definitions. I don't have to tell you again. I agree with the previous speakers and also agree that we change our method of, in, of, of investigation and um, as we move from pilot through efficacy studies towards scale up, away from quantitative um, methods more so and, and into qualitative process-based methods at large scale. Um, thank you. Next slide. Um, so I believe implementation and scale of research are conceptually distinct, but not mutually exclusive. So implementation science can be the first three bullet points. We can study factors, we can study processes, we can study the results of the implementation of the intervention on participants. And the fourth point is we can also study how to pr uh, promote and sustain potential solutions at large scale. So scale up lives within, scale up science lives within implementation science. Next slide, please. I think it's important, these are my last couple of slides, to understand the level of inquiry. If we're measuring acceptability, for example, if I'm studying it at the level of implementation, I'm more focused on how the delivery team is delivering the intervention to participants. If I'm studying at the level of scale up, I'm more interested in how the system, the support system is implementing um, the strategies at broad scale. So I'm no longer looking at the direct link from the intervention to participants, but how the system is prepared to, to deliver an intervention at broad scale. Next slide, please. Last two slides. So implementation science simply defined, I think you're gonna hear more about this from the next speaker. Simply speaking, the intervention is the thing. Implementation research, research looks at how best to do the thing, implementation strategies are the stuff we do to try to help people do the thing, and implementation outcomes are how much and how well they do the thing. Last slide, please. So can we say the same thing for scale-up simply defined? Scale-up research is how best to help more people do the thing. Scale-up strategies are the stuff we do to try to help delivery systems do the thing. And main scale-up outcomes are how many and how well delivery systems do the thing. Last slide. I'm not sure I helped at all but it gives us something to chat about. And I'm really loving us having the opportunity to um, engage in this conversation. Thanks very much. That's a hard act to follow, Heather. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Dr. Nicole Rankin from the University of Sydney, and I'd like to acknowledge I'm on the lands of the Dharawal people in the northern Illawarra and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Next slide, please, Mel. So I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction um, and reflect on some of my observations as a researcher um, who spends a lot of time building capacity in implementation science with clinician researchers 
from a wide variety of disciplines um, across the country. I want to think particularly about Heather's point about sector focus. And when we think about hospital based clinicians, um, the people I've worked with in respiratory medicine, oncology, genetic counselling, allied health, nursing, psychology, all of these people bring their own um, experience and expertise to implementation science and scale up. So I'll use the term clinician researcher just as a um, easy way of talking about anyone who fits in that category either who spends their time in hospital settings they may do research on a part-time basis or be very heavily fo focused on research but I think what we need to consider is the motivation uh, for many researchers and um, clinicians is to change practice and what's happening in their sector um, and they're frequently challenged by the lack of resources or the need necessary strategies to create change and many of them explicitly state that they want to learn the science of how to create change. So that science of implementation and scale up is fundamental to what many people want to be doing. Next slide. You've heard the definitions. I don't need to repeat them, but I do want to focus on the second point that implementation science focuses on healthcare professionals and organisational behaviours much more than focusing on patient outcomes and that this is a tension that we can we can look at uh, throughout the um, literature and also in um, the experience of clinicians. Just have to um, claim that implementation scientists love diagrams, so I've adapted a few of those for my presentation. Next slide, please. So when we're thinking about what motivates change, you'll be familiar with the behaviour change wheel. Um, clinician researchers really want to think about that motivation of what's going to change the patient experience and their own experience as clinicians. On an intervention level, clinician researchers want to test interventions and health services in settings that are complex and political. And so I definitely refute Adrian's point that implementation science focuses on the internal validity. I think most clinician researchers actually are focused on the external validity of is this intervention going to work in my workplace and will it create the change that we need? Next slide. My view is that the clinical problem comes first. So rather than the idea or the public health program, clinician researchers are motivated by the clinical problem and they want to unpack that and un understand that complexity in their own local situation and to use scientific methods then to bring about change and then move on to scale up. But first they need to identify what solutions have already been tested or trialled in practice and to develop, design or adapt interventions to make sure they work in that local environment. And using a systematic way of doing that is what most clinician researchers are interested in doing. Next slide. So when we take Curran's uh, step by step by step process that Heather just um, took us through, if we think about the thing that clinician researchers want to do, it's so important for us to consider what is it that they really want to achieve? Is it implementing a new model of care, a clinical pathway, testing a new treatment or a drug, testing a new diagnostic um, investigation? We need to start with that thing and consider, is it going to work? Because if it's not acceptable for the clinician researchers who are going to use it in practice, we might as well not start the whole process. Next slide. Implementation research looks then at how best to do the thing and we need to be able to use the research skills that Adrian's talked about with evaluation and accompany that with qualitative interviews, medical record audits, feasibility testing, the sorts of scientific methods that clinician researchers want to be able to apply in test out that intervention and understand from a scientific point of view what's going to make those interventions succeed, what will be the necessary conditions in their own health services that can enable scale up in the future. Next slide please. So implementation strategies is the stuff that we do to try and help people and this to me is where the clinician researchers get really interested in this implementation science aspect because the tools of things like audit and feedback 
or introducing new education modules or um, mobile apps for patients are the bread and butter of what a lot of clinician researchers want to go out and test. They want to test these strategies and to see if they work. And sure, they might be based on uh, a theory-based approach and they might need external funding, but unless they can actually show that these sorts of strategies will make a difference, we cannot move to the next step in the process of implementation. Next slide, please. So finally, implementation outcomes. I think it's really important that we remember that when we're collecting implementation outcomes for the um, purposes of a scientific output, you need to do that alongside with the patient-based outcomes and the clinical outcomes that clinician researchers are interested in. And I would again refute some of Adrian's points around public health having um, come for five decades beforehand, implementation science is building on the, the, uh, the greatness of what's already happened. Think about REAIM or any of the frameworks that have been developed. We're not pushing those aside, but instead we're taking them to that next level and saying, here's how we can use these frameworks to improve our science and improve practice. Next slide, please. So finally, just to sum up, I think um, implementation scientists who are the clinician researchers we all work with in an everyday setting really want to know that process of where we start, what is it we're implementing, the strategies that we're going to use, and then the outcomes that we're going to report on. And getting that balance across implementation, service and health outcomes are absolutely the bread and butter of what we need to be doing as part of the science, whilst always remembering our context that we're working in. Next slide, please. So just to finish up, I would just go back to a couple of things. I think clinician researchers working in implementation science want to make that distinction between what is implementation success or failure and what is intervention success or, uh, or failure before they are prepared to move on to scale up. The context will, cont context will matter, as will those other factors we've already talked about in the debate adaptation, flexibility, generalizability of the learning uh, that we take along the way to the next stage. Next slide, please. OK, so my last point is that then and only then does scale up begin to take hold if we have the science right at the stage of implementation and that that implementation science, the process can certainly include evaluation, but we need to have that scientific study. So I'm agreeing with Helen, uh, sorry, Heather, that I think we need to have that, um, we have to have implementation first before we can move to scale up and we can't do scale up without implementing. And I think importantly, just to finish up, scale up can take many forms. If you can convince the researchers and the clinicians in practice that what they're doing is succeeding and you can teach them those skills, you can build that capacity it will help scale up efforts much more than having the external funding to push the project to the next stage. You need to have the willing um, as part of the journey. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole and Heather. Now this starts to, uh, a few questions I start to have as I listen to the speakers. And if you have a question, please go to the Slido hashtag debate where you can, uh, if you would like to know more about whether or not these um, these differences uh, are something that we should uh, focus on or, or separate. Now, to our next speakers, our final two speakers who will speak about where does scale up start? So first, first up, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Andrew Malat, who's the Director of Events and Evaluation at the Centre of Epidemiology and at, Hunt, at the New South Wales Government Ministry of Health. Uh, following Andrew, Dr Rachel Sutherland, who is a Senior Research Fellow at the Hunter New England Local Health District and University of Newcastle, will present her views. So first to Andrew. Thanks, Mel. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners that I'm um, on today, the um, Darug people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So um, the question is, where does scale up start? Um, next slide, thanks. 
I think it's useful when we're asking that question to really uh, go back to what we think are the goals of scale up. And as um, today's presenters have demonstrated, I think we, we have different perspectives on that. It's very 2021 to have your own truth. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll give my reflections as a policymaker, but also as a sort of policymaker researcher on that topic. So, you know, the fundamental goal of scale up really is to increase the reach of effective interventions so they can ultimately improve health outcomes and well-being of the populations that we serve. It's also to uh, implement evidence-based interventions at scale where none exist. And importantly, and it's an often forgotten one, is it's to replace current interventions with more effective and efficient ones. And that's something that we don't do very well in governments, but also in public health where we cease activities and replace them with those that are more efficient. And at the bottom line of all of this, and I suppose why we're all here is that, um, and we have a passion for this, really not implementing things at scale or improving the reach of these programs does deny or delay the community's access to effective services and ultimately better health outcomes. Next slide. So where does scale up start? Next slide. So this is a conception of, uh, um, and I think it's loosely based on Adrian and Don Nutbeam's model, but it's a model that was developed for the New South Wales Translational Research Grant Scheme to talk about how interventions sort of develop, but also how they uh, integrate with research processes. And of course, it, like any uh, good intervention, it begins with idea generation. We then test the feasibility of that intervention, uh, and some people call this pilot testing. And then you move on to efficacy, and we're trying to really demonstrate here, as Adrian said, whether the exposure to this intervention results in outcomes, and often they're implemented under control conditions. The next stage is replicating and adapting that intervention. Can that uh, efficacious intervention be implemented under different conditions? Then we have effectiveness, which is a pretty important one, because what we're taking is those interventions that have been shown to be implemented uh, and are effective, and then can they be implemented under normal operational conditions? So, for example, are we going to use standalone um, uh, you know, nutrition counsellors for in a research study? When we put it into an effectiveness frame, we're using uh, nutritionists or uh, dietitians that are in hospitals and they have to implement these things as part of their usual operational arrangements. So that's a very big shift. We also have scalability as the next step, as conceived in this model, and it's about how that innovation can be integrated into wider health systems and then into monitoring, which is really how you sustain those changes. And other people call this stage institutionalisation. I think as Heather sort of highlighted and a couple of the speakers really to have the best chance of effectively scaling up, really, you should be thinking about the scalability of an intervention earlier on though in the process, even at the efficacy stage, you need to select the right interventions, gather the right people, workforce, all of those sorts of things can contribute to the ultimate success in the scale up of these interventions. But this framework really is based in a research frame. So next slide, thanks. So this is another sort of uh, way of thinking of the process of scale up and it's, um, drawn from a study, uh, well, it's actually a paper talking about examples of scale up in low and middle income countries by um, Jeffrey Smith and colleagues. And it's based on the uh, WHO expand net uh, model. And it talks about um, implementing interventions at scale, starting with piloting and advocating uh, and introducing it to new systems. The next stage is um, streamlining and building capacity. Um, with this stage, uh, we we're focusing on many, but not all of the majority of districts. And then you've got mature expansion and harmonization and institutionalization. And the goal of this really is to reach most or all districts. And you can see clearly from this model, it is really a implementation focused model from the perspective of a policymaker, because it doesn't even mention research. It talks about the reach of programs, starting from reaching one district, uh, maybe to, to the majority and then all. So it has a denominator and numerator, and that's the way that I suppose policymakers think about scale up because we're trying to reach the whole population wherever possible. Next slide. Thank you. So um, just wanted to sort of highlight a couple of studies that are interesting in this space. And you know, one way of thinking about where scale up begins is to really think about what small scale, where, where uh, interventions look like when they're uh, being implemented at small scale and when they're implemented at a system level. 
Um, I'd just like to highlight uh, a couple of papers here. Um, uh, Courts and Rutter have really produced an interesting commentary on systems approaches to scale up, and they talk about scale up as being an event in the time, uh, event in time in a system. Uh, and I, I agree partially with that, um, but I'll, I'll describe more in, in, in the next phase of the presentation. Uh, and I'd also like to talk about a really amazing example of uh, scale up of models of care. Um, and this is an article by Elizabeth Coff, the Secretary of Health in New South Wales, and Nigel Lyons, the Deputy Secretary. And they talk about um, value based health care, which is um, touching on uh, some of the work that Nic Nicole and some of the points that Nicole was making. Um, Value-based healthcare really is predicated on uh, addressing things that matter to patients first and foremost. It's about having a, 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 a patient experience that is really works for patients. It is about clinician experience because ultimately interventions won't be scaled up without in systems if they don't uh, meet the requirements of clinicians. But it's also focusing on effective interventions and doing that in the most efficient way. So those are some of the principles that underpin value-based healthcare. So when we are thinking about implementing things on a small scale, often there is controlled delivery. We have a lot of the elements of the intervention delivery and the research process under our control. When we're implementing things at a system level, we have far less control. We are operating across different settings with different groups. Uh, so control is something that we have to, to release, <laughs> relinquish a little bit. Uh, when we're operating on a small scale, we often have the ability to really determine the efficacy of, your, of an intervention. However, you can't determine the efficacy all the time. Um, you can do that periodically when you're implementing at a system level. And what we focus on is monitoring system in, in, implementation and some of the markers of what uh, a successful rollout of a program looks like. Often when we're working on a small scale, relationships are a bit simpler. They're bi-directional. We might be implementing a trial in five schools in a particular uh, area. Uh, we can deal with principals. We have uh, teachers in those schools that may be trained up. They may be curriculum materials. They're, they're often bi-directional relationships. However, if you're implementing things across a whole system like we are with things like value-based healthcare, you have dynamic relationships across the system. And those relationships of between clinicians and patients, for example, they're between clinicians and hospital administrators, between hospital administrators and chief executives, chief executives and service level agreements, uh, working with ministries of health and treasuries. So there's much more uh, depth in the dynamic relationships and there are many stakeholders involved, highlighting some of the challenges of scale up in that setting. Often we're involved in single settings on small scale, and then we are involved in diverse settings, you know, different communities, different resource profiles, different size hospitals. Often we're focusing on individual capacity when we are operating on a small scale. And then if we ultimately want to change um, uh, systems and scale things up, we have to focus really on organisational culture and capacity. Often we are thinking when we're operating on a small scale around interventions and the types of things that we're doing, it's very, very focused on that. But ultimately, if we want to change things at a system level, often we have to leave the intervention to the side and allow the implementation arms of the organisation, for example, local health districts, to determine the exact nature of the intervention with some fidelity. And we have to change systems to achieve those outcomes. And finally, uh, when we're often dealing on a small scale, we're really dealing with early adopters. You know, a small trial, we're dealing with the people that are very enthusiastic that want to join us, and they are either researchers, policy makers, and implementers. But when we're implementing things uh, across a whole system, the challenge is that, of course, early adopters will come along with us. There'll be a whole bunch of people in the middle who don't really care either way, and they will adopt uh, given the right circumstances. But you also have a, a proportion of people who resist change. So when we're trying to implement things on a system level, we have to take everyone on a journey uh, across from the early adopters all the way through to those that are a bit more resistant and convince them and train them and provide them with all of the resources to enable them to implement change. Next slide. One, one minute, Andrew, you're already over. No, that's okay. So um, in terms of who leads up the scale up process, well, there's a variety of people. And I think um, Heather and Adrian have talked a little bit about, you know, the different types of people that are involved in leading the scale up process, but I'd argue that there are various people that lead up scaling up depending on the stage of an intervention development, the nature of the intervention itself, the context, who is funding it, uh, political will and leadership and resource availability. And my take on this is that 
scale up is a multidisciplinary process with shifting leadership and shifting responsibility. Sometimes politicians can even lead it. So many of you might recall that the first national drug strategy was uh, Bob Hawke's idea. His daughter was struggling with drug addiction and he made it happen. Uh, John Howard with gun reform, uh, gun control laws in Australia. Sometimes it's force of will, sometimes it's policy makers, sometimes it's philanthropic organisations, but there are different ways that uh, things are scaled up and ultimately led. Next slide. So this is uh, some work by Haynes and Collie who talk about implementation handover. So um, essentially, if we don't have a process in place to think about from the beginning of a study about how uh, interventions will be handed over for implementation at either a local or a state level from the beginning, next slide. Interventions don't really go through to that next stage. Um, and this is just a bit of a, a, a diagram that talks a little bit about how a researcher can really think about those things at the beginning and gather the right team, clinicians, policymakers, to ensure that at the end of these research projects, there is local implementation and state implementation, but that has to be really planned from the beginning. Next slide. So this is that same sort of concept uh, and talking about a switch in governance uh, from researchers, local champions, when we are thinking about um, trials that are implemented at a local level. And then ultimately, if these trials are ever to be sort of implemented across whole regions, they need to switch the governance and the governance lead needs to really be executives, chief executives of local health districts and relevant leaders. And if the same thing, if we want statewide implementation, we have to think about switching the governments from local structures to statewide uh, agencies. And this could be uh, a similar thing for national implementation. Researchers are a fundamental part of this process as is research, but at certain points in time, there needs to be a switch in the leadership of these interventions. So in conclusion, next slide. Scale up process uh, can, can really be conceptualized differently depending on the perspective that you're in. You have a different perspective of scale up as a clinician, as a policymaker, as a politician, as a researcher. Scale up itself is a multidisciplinary process and it does draw on multiple sciences, economics, organisational change, uh, evaluation, implementation science. It really does draw upon multiple disciplines and scale up across systems and communities really does require that switch in governance and leadership across different stages of its implementation. So thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, this question of where scale up starts has been one that I guess I've been pondering for a while. Um, and it's a really interesting question. And I think my views of this have changed um, dramatically over time. So next slide. And that's because I'm coming to this question wearing many different hats. So um, as a research practitioner, so I have a regional remit and at heart, I'm still a um, health promotion practitioner and a dietitian. Um, I'm also a policymaker. So uh, I, I develop and implement and um, set policy at a regional level, but also more recently at a state level. And then also I have a research hat. So I'm really interested in the question of how do we scale up and how do we retain the effectiveness? And I think my view of where scale up starts has differed from different perspectives. So exactly like Andrew um, spoke about. Next slide, please. So if we think about scale up at the definition by the WHO of taking an evidence-based intervention and then um, making that intervention reach more people, um, where does scale up start? So perhaps as a researcher, my role is um, in the idea generation, in um, developing feasibility, testing efficacy, um, and then um, the reproducibility and adaptability of that. And traditionally as a researcher, I thought scale up occurred in somebody else's domain and it wasn't my domain. Next slide, please. When I have my practitioner hat on, my role is to think about a health issue, take an evidence-based intervention, have a think about whether there are evidence-based implementation strategies and dissemination strategies, and if they, um, if they are available, then apply that intervention as my usual service delivery model. If those evidence-based interventions aren't there, then my role might be to um, do some testing or some evaluation around some intervention and implementation and dissemination strategies. But I, as a practitioner, I feel I definitely have a role in scaling that up as usual service delivery, um, wherever my remit is. Next slide, please. 
And as a policymaker, again, I've shifted a little bit more to the right again. So my role is definitely in the scale up domain. And again, I'm taking an evidence based intervention. I'm hoping there are systematic reviews to guide me around implementation models and dissemination models. But then I'm scaling up that evidence based um, intervention and embedding in systems and usual processes. Next slide. And luckily, there are decision trees that help guide either researchers, practitioners, or policymakers around um, do we need to. Uh, are evidence-based interventions available and can we just um, use them or do we actually need to undertake a research step to help guide the implementation and the scale up? Next slide. So this all sounds great um, in theory and that scale up occurs towards the end of a translation phase. However, the above processes really rely on the generation of evidence-based interventions that are suitable for scale up. And as Heather described, not all interventions that have been developed are suitable for scale. So many interventions that are developed in the early phase of research aren't suitable, and that's because they've been developed and they're not contextually relevant to the um, area or the region that you'd like to implement it in. They're often complex and too costly to deliver at scale. They often rely on resources that are not available, usually within the setting. Um, they may not be consistent with usual systems or processes where they need to be embedded. Often they're not co-designed with the end users or the stakeholders that need to use them in practice, um, and they've never been developed with scale up in mind. So as a result, few of our evidence-based interventions um, that are developed in the early phases of research are never scaled up. And this forces policymakers and practitioners to select interventions that require significant adaptation to be used um, at scale and within the real world, and that policymakers and practitioners have to end up scaling up interventions without a real evidence base. So next slide, please. So unfortunately, um, the limited research that has been done on scale up and how effective that is in practice um, really confirms that what we're doing and how we're scaling up probably isn't having the effect that we'd like it to have. So for example, there's very few interventions that are scaled up and evaluated. So some research by Indig um, showed that in the public health domain, there's only 40 examples across all of public health that demonstrate a scale up process. And another example is in the Lancet, um, there were 16 examples of physical activity interventions that have been taken from an efficacy right up to the scale up phase. Um, when we look at scale up research, there's very few that follow that comprehensive pathway like we'd like them to. So they've been tested, then they've been taken into the real world, and then they've been scaled up. And then when we have a look at um, reviews of scale up, so where they have um, looked at interventions from efficacy all the way up to scale up, we see that once they go into the scale up domain, 100% of those interventions require adaptation to actually being taken into the real world. So as a result, we end up with ineffective interventions. So for example, there's been some research done in obesity, physical activity and nutrition, and we can see that there's a real scale up penalty. So we're not preserving the intervention effects that we've had in the early days when we take them to scale, but by as much as 75% of interventions are losing um, their effect. And ultimately, this is a waste of our really scarce health resources. So next slide, please. So is this occurring because we actually think of scale up much too late in the piece? So my original thoughts of where scale up occurred later in the piece, do we actually need to be thinking about scale up and scalability right from the outset? So in that very early research phase. Next slide, please. So I, I guess our newer models of scale up um, take scale up from from being um, at the end of a translation phase to actually demonstrating scale up is a process or a pathway um, and that there are many different pathways to scale up. So there's this comprehensive pathway from development, efficacy, testing, real world and dissemination, but ultimately there can be a number of different pathways. Next slide, please. And this example from New South Wales, the child care munch and move process is a really um, great example of following a comprehensive pathway. So over the um, span of about seven to 10 years, um, an intervention has been taken from that efficacy phase in an RCT. It's then been scaled up into, I guess, a real world effectiveness trial in Good for Kids. 
and then a dissemination trial to evaluate implementation and dissemination models to then being picked up statewide by policymakers and rolled out across um, childcare services across New South Wales, where now we have approximately 400,000 children in formal care, um, I guess, that are benefiting from this evidence-based intervention. Next slide, please. And so if we think about needing to think about scale up from these really early phases, there are um, frameworks and theories that help us think about the characteristics of, in, of interventions that we can be ultimately using to guide how we design and how we build evidence-based interventions. And so research shows us that if we adopt these types of characteristics, then these types of interventions are more likely to be adopted and are more likely to be taken to scale. And they, these are things thinking about, um, does the intervention have relative advantage? Is it compatible with usual systems? Is it simple? Is it trialable? And can we observe the effects? And similarly, in the ExpandNet WHO um, acronym, they use the acronym um, correct to look at the attributes of an intervention. So is it credible? Is it observable? Is it relevant to the context that we're going to implement it in? Does it have relative advantage? Can it be installed easily by policymakers and within systems? And is it compatible and testable? And these are all things that we need to be thinking um, of from the outset when we're designing our interventions as researchers, rather than thinking about it um, at the end stage of a research translation phase. Next slide, please. And finally, just to sum up, my my thinking has shifted dramatically. So I think I used to always think of scale up as being an end phase, but I'm now realising that we need to think about this very early in um, the piece. We need to consider how we're designing for scale from the outset, and that's looking at intervention characteristics. It's thinking about co-design and conducting extensive formative evaluation with our end users and with stakeholders, and it's assessing scalability as we go along these different um, research translation phases. So we always have scale in mind um, as we're developing. And I think I lastly just want to finish that if we're thinking about where does scale up start, maybe we also have to think about where does scale up end? Is that when it's institutionalised? It's, is it when the intervention is self-sustaining or is it when something's commercialised? But I think that end piece is just as interesting as the beginning bit of where scale up starts. All right, I'm going to stop sharing now and bring you bring all the presenters up. Thank you, everyone. I'm not sure about uh, the audience, but I'm, I've am i now found a whole lot of ideas popping around in my head. Is implementation science the same as scale up? Uh, is, should one go, should the chicken go before the egg, as Rachel just uh, uh, alluded to, uh, which Adrian also spoke about. So over to our first questions for the from the audience. Um, and I, I probably will start with this one. Should these differences in definition and different ideas that the six presenters uh, have raised, should we hope to bring these together to form one concise um, definition, one idea of what we think implementation scale up is? Um, open to the speakers. Uh, you're all got yeah, the year. Okay, here we go. I'll go. Um, yes, yes, we should. Yes, we should. We should absolutely do that. And there's been some efforts to do so by coming up with a common taxonomy. But I think you know cultures are difficult to shift. And I think that um, the terms and, the, and and so on and the definitions and our understanding of them are, are really steeped in the different cultures. I know that mental health and a Addictions approaches implementation sites quite differently than than child you know than child health research and so on. So um, if, if we could, yes. But I think the sectors uh, which publish in different journals and very sector based journals have to be talking across implementation and scale up um, science. Well, I just get a reflection on that. I think one of the um, the challenges is that you know, scale up and implementation science is multidisciplinary. And then often when you have people coming from different perspectives, as Heather mentioned, um, 
inevitably you're going to have a mixing of those ideas and really what prevails is the challenge. Um, you know, in the United States, they have a different view as Heather highlighted in her presentation of what constitutes um, scale up and uh, implementation, which is uh, different from a sort of Canadian slash Australian version. But look, it's a battle of ideas, but at the end of the day, I think the objective at the end is the most important thing uh, that we're trying to increase people's exposure to effective interventions and um, get a, get good health outcomes as a result of that. Um, but there are many ways to do it and it is a challenge. And I, I too, like Heather, wish that we could have some harmonization of terminology. And I think Heather is, and Adrian and everyone around uh, today's presentation have tried to do that by publishing some papers to bring around, as you say, a, a common sort of understanding and taxonomy, but we'll keep on trying. Anyone else want to answer that question before I go to a new one? Oh, okay, uh, another question is, how do we embrace the complexity and build a rapid learning system? So a few people have asked about systems thinking and how that fits into all of this understanding. Adrian. Program evaluation, when we're looking at implementation at scale up, is really very analogous to complex program evaluation. In other words, when I'm describing not the controlled part, the science part, but the, the more practice linked program evaluation, it can vary a lot. It's embedded in different systems. You use different approaches to scale up something in the education system or the sports sector than you do in the health services or a health system or a rheumatology clinic. So that's actually quite a different set of perspectives. But because it's embedded in systems, the real world practice of implementation is system level and system level evaluation, which is less codifiable than the science generating evidence on what to do. So we need to go back to the science and make it better so that we can actually do those things better. But in practice, we're often left with complex systems. Yeah, Heather. Yeah, and I just want to jump jump aboard that answer a little bit. And, and I guess I would hate for us to be paralyzed by the complexity of all of this. I, I, I think that we are working within very complex and dynamic systems across and that, you know, so they're changing over time. They're complex to begin with. And we might have a handle on the levels of organizations. And as Andrew said, the many, many stakeholders that are engaged. And then that's going to shift in politics based on an election cycle, probably. So, but as researchers, I think we need to do the best we can and not be paralyzed by understanding perfectly the complexity of a system to understand the factors that affect implementation and scale up. All right, unfortunately my screen keeps jumping, but uh, a question, actually this is a question again for Heather and maybe others have got an idea too. What do we need to be considering uh, to avoid retrofitting. When we think about scaling up at the beginning, how do we ensure that we don't retrofit? Yeah, you know what, Rich, can I pass that to you? Because I've been doing a lot of the talking and you talked about beginning with the end in mind in your school-based yeah. programs and those would be lovely examples. I think we need to get a lot better of working together with practitioners, with policy makers, with end users from the outset. So. Um, as researchers, we're not guessing about what the end looks like. We're actually finding out from those that are going to be using the intervention. So um, the, those co-design processes um, and extensive form, formative evaluation um, is really important. And I think checking in along the way um, is really important. So I spoke about those characteristics of interventions. So as researchers, we can build those characteristics into our interventions, but unless we're doing that alongside end users, then I think we're just guessing. So I think it's working in partnership, um, designing with, with the end in mind. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so can I just add, add to that? Um, I guess, um, you know, because there's, because contexts are so important in, in scale up and ultimately the impact of our interventions, um, 
that you know when you're when you're undertaking kind of co-production processes with end users you know it's very geared towards their specific context and often we have interventions that we might take from overseas or other parts of the country or different jurisdiction and want to apply that locally just because we think that's an appropriate intervention for um you know for our kind of context or the context that that we're in and so i guess that there is um certainly we need to start with the end use in mind but i think adaptation and some modification of of interventions and delivery strategies is likely inevitable because not every intervention is universally applicable um, and so maybe it's a process of of designing with end use in mind um, but also um, uh, you know applying methods to try and appraise the, the the fit i guess of different interventions with the context that you've got and i know um, you know karen lee and and others have done work around scalability assessments to help make those decisions. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, how do we reconcile interventions delivered at scale that don't have an evidence base? Anyone? That, that's, a, that's a good question for Andrew. How, how <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's, it's a tough one and uh, health systems, community programs, uh, they exist in, in many disciplines. And look, they can be very challenging to uh, put to the sword. <laughs> and um, those of you who've been policymakers would realise that there are some, uh, you know, seemingly uh, very engaging and interesting things uh, that might have sort of peripheral benefits that have never been subject to evaluation, really that continue to get political support and continue. So, I mean, I think the only thing I can say is that, um, you know, as a policymaker, that the more that we talk about things like the importance of implementation, the, the importance of scale up, the importance of implementing um, evidence based interventions, that that can really permeate uh, the, the structures that we work in. And certainly, um, I think the more that we focus on this science and implementation and scale up, the more that that concept sort of permeates the, the, the different structures and decision making bodies. But look, inevitably, you're going to get things that are implemented that are not evidence based. And sometimes that's a really a good thing. I mean, there was no evidence that tobacco control strategies worked and they were implemented. So if we were to wait for evidence um, all the time, we wouldn't have very much public health action. We didn't necessarily, look, we might have known uh, about the effectiveness of seatbelts, but we didn't know what the impact would be when they were scaled up. Uh, gun control the same. So look, I think, you know, sometimes you have to be bold as well. Um, but unfortunately, when you are bold, you often uh, will put things in there that are not evidence based. So I think it's the case of de deprioritizing those if we can, but it can be challenging. Oh, thank you. Um, question here, if scale up is about efficacy and reach, how should we consider scaling up an implementation in our increasingly diverse, uh, culturally diverse society? I can speak to that. And, and I mean, there's a literature around cultural adaptation of innovations or cultural adaptation of, of interventions. And, and I think the point um, that's made in those, in that literature is that cultural adaptation is more than just translating an intervention into French or, or another language. It's about, again, back to rate, Rachel's comments about we need to understand who our end users are. We need to understand the culture within which we're trying to implement. And we can only do that by having those partners, whether they're uh, design partners or delivery partners in place and a really authentic part of our teams at the very beginning of our conversations about the research and the interventions. Thanks. This is a question for um, Nicole, I'm going to send it your way. At the moment, the urgent question is how does systematically, how does the systematically implementation science approach, um, how do you do that in the urgent pandemic response besides throwing resources at it? Ah, good question. I, I guess um, much of what we're doing is um, based on many years of evidence already being gathered. So if you think about some of the work that um, Professor Julie leesk has been doing around communication of how people deal with vaccination. We, we need to draw on um, those existing examples and then to be able to adapt them more quickly. And I think um, 
this is partly it's part um, about partnerships and making sure that um, the the academic research that's gone uh, beforehand is actually brought to the fore um, and I appreciate that can be challenging when there's such an overwhelming um, amount of evidence that's focused on um, the epidemiology and the modelling of the disease uh, and that people are very concerned about that. But if we can actually look at some of the strategies that have worked in other contexts and in other situations, um, then we need to you know, be able to draw on those immediately rather than uh, leaving the communication piece to one side. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, anyone else or I'll, I'll go to the next question. Uh, I'm not quite trying to understand this question. It's received a few quotes. So is scale up, we talk about scale up as an early decision. Um, so what's the so, so what factor and the impact for public good? Actually, I think that's more of a comment. Let's let me go to another question instead. How do we embed the type of shared learning on implementation scale up across public health systems so that it remains a living, self-sustaining process? Um, I mean, I just add, I'll add a couple yeah. of my thoughts. Were you going to say something, Andrew? No, no, go for it. Go for it. I mean, I, I think I think we need to. Um, be better at developing communities of practice, uh, not not just amongst researchers, but those that are responsible for implementing programs and scaling them up in practice. Um, I, th I think there are certainly sites that do that very well, but um, in the broad, there's plenty of scope for um, shared learning and to advance the science quickly through a more collaborative ways of working together um, of building the evidence base and ensuring that that evidence kind of involves um, over time, both in its use and its practice, in, sorry, in its generation and its practice. And just to follow on what uh, uh, Luke said, I mean, I think the communities of practice are really important. Um, also, uh, an organisational commitment to scale up processes. So, for example, value based healthcare is one of the four strategic priorities of New South Wales Ministry of Health. So, there's a clear statement to the system that we are interested in taking effective interventions and models of care and scaling those up across whole systems. And um, communities of practice are really fundamental in that. So uh, clinical networks are engaged in that, clinical champions, there's feedback through systemized measurement of clinician experience of implementing interventions. There's also uh, patient experience. So there's a whole series of uh, what we call PREMS and PROMS, and that data is fed into the whole scale up process in New South Wales. Um, around a whole range of clinical models of care. And all of those interventions are actually uh, co-designed uh, between researchers, uh, policy makers, and um, clinicians and practitioners on the ground. So even before these uh, areas are identified, there's a co-design process. So I think there are um, promising signs in some parts of the system. And you know, New South Wales is a great experiment in that. Um, but yeah, that community of practice and engagement and something that we've been doing in our team is been providing a lot of training around evaluation, program logic, scale up science, um, all of these things to really build the system's capability to successfully uh, reflect on its own implementation and think about um, how ultimately you would scale something up in practice. Uh, just a couple more, I'll just take two more questions before we finish. Um, and the first one is, what's the role of pragmatism in implementation or scale up? A few people spoke about, Adrian, maybe you want to answer this. She spoke about pragmatism. Pragmatism is required in implementation practice, not in implementation science, because implementation science needs clear rules, rules for both qualitative research or quantitative research, rules for standards on research quality, but, but implementation practice is where pragmatism is required, where flexibility is required by context and by different settings with different kinds of measures, with different kinds of evaluation budgets and capacity. Yeah, no, thanks for explaining. And, and last question here is, uh, bold interventions are what's needed to make big impact on NCDs. What's the harm in trying interventions without efficacy? when there is low risk of harm. 
I, I think as um, scientists, we have a responsibility um, to the evidence and to present the evidence, and there's a cost involved. Um, there's a cost involved, and if we're talking about implementation at broad scale, it's a t cost to taxpayers um, to implement. I mean, Andrew, you can probably take that from take the take take this answer from there. But but I think there is a responsibility to implement as best we can um, practices and programs where the evidence to support that they're going to work. Simply speaking, doesn't always happen, as Andrew said, and it cannot always happen. But wherever possible, I think it um, it should should be supported by evidence. Andrew, anything to add there? Yeah, Heather, thanks. That's a great, great response. And I think the only thing I, I would add is that, look, I, I think we should be bold um, in public health and health promotion, um, and we do need those ideas. But we do, before we actually spend, you know, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars on something, we do need evidence. I mean, I think that would be the, you know, it's not to say that you can't trial bold, bold ideas, see if it works, but that at some stage through that process, you should really see whether it's achieving its intended objective. And certainly me as a policymaker, the advice myself and my colleagues would be saying, yes, be bold, but um, you do need to know whether it works or not, particularly before going to scale. And there are many opportunities to do that. There are fantastic examples of things that have been, as I mentioned before, that didn't have necessarily an evidence base around them, but they were tried, but they were subsequently evaluated and the evidence is there that they did work. So um, I think that's what we have an obligation to do is still be bold. And I'd almost view it, I mean, I know, I don't want to say it's like an investment portfolio, but I mean, as a policymaker, you often think that way. Sometimes there are high risk, potential high return things, and you, you do those, sometimes but you do need the solid you, the core part of your portfolio that's going to produce the results on a regular basis really has to be those evidence-based activities and but there's nothing wrong with taking risks i think um, but it needs to be proportional and just uh, I'll just add to that given we have so many evidence-based interventions that have been developed and shown to work to take something that's not not trialled and tested and run with that one. I mean, maybe in the absence of any evidence, you have to be bold, you have to do something. But in areas where there have been, um, you know, ideas and programs and policies that have been tested and there is evidence there, then yeah, definitely then they're the ones that we should stick with before we spend a lot of money on something else. Yeah. No, now, before we, uh, Adrienne will close for us, but I'd just like to see if any of the other uh, speakers, if anyone has a last point that they'd, actually I'd like a last point from um, all of you, if you can just tell me what's your, uh, after this discussion, what's your, what's your key idea you want to bring back to us? Uh, I'll get us started. Uh, that seems to be <laughs> my role. Um, I, I would just like I would like us to dig into the science, and I would like us to dig into um, to dig into implementation and scale up because I actually feel that it's more than science. I feel like it's a responsibility that we uh, for uh, for us if we show that something works to figure out how we can have the greatest impact and the largest. Um, number of people. So I would love those on the line who are students or early career, you know, academics to sort of take a look at the science because it's quite fascinating and there's so, so many questions left to be answered. I'll go next. I, I think um, just building on Heather's point, and also what Rachel was saying, if we can be thinking about um, that co-design and the engagement with our um, uh, end users is one way of looking at it, but um, the partners, I suppose, it's it's the consumers, it's patients, it's communities, but um, also if you don't have that buy-in from uh, the health providers who are going to deliver interventions, um, you're up for a really hard challenge in terms of trying to push things uphill rather than um, the, the pull factor of bringing people along on that interesting journey. So I, I think um, the more we can invest in the pre-implementation phases of engaging with stakeholders, uh, the greater the chances are out of success. Um, I'll jump in. Um, so I think um, my, what I, I guess what I've taken away from this and what I've been thinking about 
um, in terms of scale up research um, over the past couple of years um, is just reflecting on how challenging work in this space is, you know, how little research is kind of currently available. And I guess the risk to the discipline um, and also, I guess, to our efforts to achieve implementation at scale um, is if we kind of undertake research which is not kind of coordinated or harmonised in some way. Um, because of the difficulty of the research production process for scale up, I guess I'd like to see um, us uh, work on some of the, I guess, core um, issues in the field that um, will help us work together and share the research that we um, do undertake so that we can kind of advance as quickly as possible. I'd like to agree with Luke as well and just to add that I think, um, you know, forums like this are really important for us to lay our cards out on the table and when Adrian invited us, he was open to us sort of having different perspectives on this. But I think um, what is clear is that, you know, as a field, um, the more we talk about it, the more that we actually train people in this space, the more that we are getting people to think about potential collaborations in this way will mean that we will get uh, to reorient the system to focus more on the types of research that is optimally beneficial uh, for policymakers to adopt it. And it's not just policymakers, it may be things may be commercialised. It may be there are many sort of pathways to scale up. And I think we just need to be flexible in our thinking about that. And also and not forgetting that the science is really important throughout that process. And uh, scale up by its very nature is multidisciplinary. You need economists, you need people who have cl uh, clinicians at the coalface, you need uh, consumers' opinions or patient views, you need uh, information from multiple sources. And that all has to be pulled together in a systematic way. And I think what implementation and scale up science helps us to pull all of that complexity together in a way that's understandable and that we can use a common language to then implement strategies. And I mean, I would agree along that theme. So as a practitioner, as a policymaker and as a researcher, um, ultimately the goal is to deliver interventions and programs to community that retain their effect. And so how can we do that where we're all working together in partnership from the beginning um, to improve the science? So ultimately the, the programs at scale are still effective as those ones you know, that they were when they were in that efficacy stage. And final words from Adrian, who will finish up. And just before you speak, I'm sorry for those we didn't get through all those questions. And you may have a question you'd like to uh, uh, ask us or specific, uh, get in touch with a specific speaker. Please uh, welcome to email me. My details are on uh, the uh, the invitation. Thank you, um, everybody. Firstly, thanks to the audience. Thanks to Mel Crane for facilitating and to Karen Lee and Karen Metcalf for behind the scenes work in making this happen and the Prevention Centre for hosting this. Thanks to the presenters, but this is a group of presenters who wear multiple hats. And I really mean multiple hats, more than you'll find in many places. We both have quite some diverse views. As a group, we actually all work together in a very collaborative and respectful Presented today, much more diverse. Adrian, please come towards the camera. We can't hear you. Okay. Um, so this is a diverse group, but it's a collaborative group, and the field is actually more challenged and more diverse outside of this group. Um, we need to consider the context of scale up. We need to consider delivery systems. We need to consider where scale up starts. Does it start after replication and before dissemination? Or does scale up start when the policy window opens, when resources are mobilized and the priorities actually make it happen, which are system based ways when scale up starts, not researcher led ways when scale up starts? We need to think about sustainment and how we can make things continue beyond the time that we are implementing them. We need to think about our perspectives. Are, are we a researcher, a policymaker, or a practitioner? And we need to design with scale up in mind from the outset. 
And I'll leave you with only one final thought that kind of epitomizes the challenge that we have in this area. There's one problem facing us all at the moment where evidence generation may not be timely enough to solve the problem. And that's how we're we going to implement strategies for climate change globally. And that illustrates the difference between things that we desperately need at scale and the science where we need evidence as well. And the tension between these two plagues a lot of what we do, particularly in public health, um, which, is, which is my discipline. That's my last thought. I'd like to thank all of you for participating. I think it's been an interesting dialogue, um, but a cordial and collaborative one. And I hope that you, the audience has got some thoughts and ideas to think more about scale up early and often.